We had dinner uh, at our house last night, and uh, being in Florida, we had some fried catfish and some okra. We had some uh, fried pickles, and what else we have? We had some other things. We had ching tao beer uh, and some ribs and everything, and the minister was so impressed that he told me that he is going to probably just stay here and defect to Florida. And <laughs> No, but no. kidding aside, uh, what a wonderful opportunity to have a chance to meet and personally speak with someone who's not only so knowledgeable, but such a decent person, and to get down below the surface and, and try and understand more, because we really need to understand more about each other. And without his leadership uh, and putting this together over a period of time, we wouldn't have the outstanding delegation from China that came here. So. Would you do me a favor? Uh, how about standing up and welcoming him, the minister for what everything he's done? Thank you so much. Okay, they're all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, Congressman Liu Fry. Uh, Dear students and faculty, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much, Congressman Liu Frey, for your warm introduction. Uh, thank you for having me here today. It's wonderful to be here. Let, first of all, let me convey the best wishes and regards from Ambassador Zhang Yesui and the Chinese Embassy to all of you. It's really a first visit for me and my colleagues, most of my colleagues, I think, to Florida, the famous sunshine state in the U.S., and Orlando, a beautiful city and vibrant city. But I have to say that before we came, I had heard, about lot, or heard a lot about it. I guess I can say proudly that the Orlando Magic and its star player, Dwight Howard, may have more fans in China than in the whole America. And the Disney World has become a household name and a dream place for China kids. This land is also home to the world-renowned Kennedy Space Center, of course, which has a close relationship with the USCF. I learned that the USCF has about 56,000 students coming from all, all across America and more than 140 countries, making UCF the second largest American university in student enrollment. UCF is also rated one of the most up-and-coming universities in this country. So for all these reasons, it's a great pleasure for me to be here and meet the students and faculty of this outstanding institution of learning. I also want to commend the Low Frey Institute of Politics and Government for a successful forum on China-U.S. relations. For the past one and a half days, I'm sorry, for the past half day, <laughs> I think uh, the participants had some most exciting, inspiring, in-depth discussions on many of the key aspects of our bilateral relations. I think the most important takeaway for all of us is that we need to better appreciate others' ideas and to build a sense of mutual understanding and trust, which we did. And I hope we'll see more of these kind of discussions in the future. The homework that our host has assigned me today is how I look at China-U.S. relations. To that end, I want to talk about how the relationship has become, what it is, and where it is heading. This year marks the 40th anniversary of the reopening of the relationship. Over the, past 40 decades, over, over the past four decades, China-U.S. relations have gone through an extraordinary journey. As everyone agreed, this journey is never short of ups and downs, but it has been moving forward nonstop. What's been driving it forward? In my opinion, it is the converging interests that bound us together, which continue to grow with each passing, which each, each passing day. It is the success stories of cooperation that we have seen one after another and it is the shared responsibilities that both of us shoulder. Looking back at the past 40 years, it is fair to say that China and U.S. relations have truly made historic progress. The relationship is increasingly characterized by a clear and positive trend. Forty years ago, China and America, like two strangers who first met, had to feel the way in the dark to find out how to get along. Today, we're working together to build what we call a cooperative partnership based on mutual respect, mutual benefit. What does this partnership mean? 
It means that the two sides would treat each other with respect and as equal partners, and agree to disagree. We will build a comprehensive and mutually beneficial economic partnership. We will collaborate worldwide to, take, to tackle common challenges. We will deepen friendship by involving the broad, broadest participation of our people, and we will ensure regular and candid high-level communications. I think this new definition of our bilateral relationship is just another step forward since the two sides decided to build the positive, cooperative, and comprehensive China-U.S. relations in 2009. It speaks well for the deepening trust between the two cities, between the two sides, and the rising maturity of the relationship. There are active engagements from the top level down and open channels for dialogue. Forty years ago, there were few contacts between us. Yet in the past two years alone, President Hu Jintao of China and President Obama of the United States have met four to- eight times altogether, with President Obama paying state visit to China in 2009 and President Hu to the U.S. earlier this year. In addition, the two heads of state have maintained regular and close contacts by telephone calls and correspondence. There are over 60 formal bilateral dialogue mechanisms, including the strategic and economic dialogue, and a high-level consultation of people-to-people and cultural exchanges. For Mr. Yang of China and Secretary of State Hillary Clinton are staying in close touch through visits and bilateral meetings. Such frequent, intensive, and deep communications play an increasingly important role in reducing misgivings, enhancing understanding, and strengthening reassurances in both ways and enables them to work more closely together. We are now connected by deeper independence, converging interests and cross-the-board cooperation. Forty years ago, there was little trade between the two sides, let alone mutual mutual investment. Today, we are each other's second largest trade partner, with the total trade volume reaching 385.3 billion U.S. dollars in 2010, which is 160 times over that at the opening of our diplomatic relationship. China has been the fastest growing export market for America in the past 10 years in running and is one of the main destinations for American investment. Chinese investment in this country is also growing rapidly in recent years, creating many job opportunities for the local communities. Since 2000, for instance, Costco, a leading Chinese shipping line, has made big investment in the port of Boston. This helped create 9,000 job opportunities and revitalize the local economy. I hope there will be more Chinese companies with their investment being put to create jobs here in Florida and Orlando. So it is no exaggeration to say that other, our business relationship represents the most vibrant and successful part in our relationship. In addition, our two countries are also working effectively together on law enforcement, energy, environment, science and technology, education, culture, health, and many other areas. Together, China and the United States are working closely at the regional and global level. Forty years ago, the world is, was under the shadow of the Cold War. With the Cold War now in the past, we find ourselves in the face of many new and emerging challenges that require a collective response. In the meantime, in this globalized world, our interests and <clears throat> destinies are tied to each other more than ever before. We have more and more common responsibilities in our sh- on our shoulder to make the world a safer place and to ensure that the world populations will be better off. Together, we've made a lot of progress in responding to the financial crisis. The reform of international financial architecture, climate change, and non-proliferation. We are collaborating on international and regional hotspots, such as the Korean Peninsula nuclear issue and the Iranian nuclear issue. We now have robust people-to-people exchanges that shore up the popular support for the overall relationships. Forty years ago, the Chinese and Americans were really reached out to each other. Today, more than 3 million people are traveling across the Pacific every year, with over 110 passenger flights and 170 cargo flights shuttling back and forth every week. There are 36 pairs of sister province state relations and 161 sister city relations between us. I'm glad to tell you, just in case you don't know, that Orlando has also a sister city in China, Guilin, a famous and beautiful, nice Chinese city, visited by millions of tourists every year. In terms of educational exchanges, about 120,000 Chinese students are studying in the United States, including those in the UCF. More than 20,000 American students are studying in China. 
When President Obama visited China in 2009, he announced the plan to send 100,000 students from America to China in the coming four years. This is indeed a visionary decision and will bring our young people much closer. Together, therefore, in a short span of 40 years, our relations have gone through sweeping transformation. We have made from virtually no contact to enjoying a flourishing all dimensional relationship. The relations have reached such a breadth and depth that was never seen in history. We need each other more than ever when it is bilaterally, regionally, or globally. The implications of China-U.S. relations have gone far beyond the bilateral scope and assumed greater strategic significance. What has happened proves that a stronger relationship is not only a blessing for our two countries and peoples, but also contributes to peace, stability, and prosperity in Asia-Pacific and the world at large. Of course, due to the different social systems, cultural traditions, levels of economic development, we don't always see eye to eye on everything. But more than anything else, I think our common interests far outweigh our differences. The China-U.S. relationship is all about dialogue and cooperation. And the voices of friendship but better, are, much, are always louder than a few jarring notes. We're not rivals against each other, but partners in the same boat. We will both gain from cooperation and lose from confrontation. With the above in mind, we've always been able to work through challenges and kept the relations on the right track. Last January, President Hu Jintao paid a state visit to the United States. This is a very successful visit. Within 68 hours, he visited Washington, D.C., in Chicago. President Hu and President Obama discussed China-U.S. relations at length, addressed a number of international and regional issues, and reached important consensus. The two sides issued a joint statement reaffirming the shared commitment to building a cooperative partnership based on mutual respect, mutual benefit. We have agreed to build a comprehensive mutually beneficial economic partnership, contributing to a stronger, sustainable, and balanced growth of our two economies and that of the world. The visit also produced concrete results. The two sides signed a number of agreements. Our businesses have also sealed partnerships, which covers trade, investment, technology, people-to-people -people and cultural exchanges, energy environment, high-speed railway, and smart grids. China is going to purchase 45 billion U.S. dollars of American products, including 19 billion U.S. dollars contract to buy 200 Boeing aircrafts. As President Obama said at the joint press conference, from machinery to software, from aviation to agriculture, these deals will support about, we support some 300, 235,000 American jobs. We've also mapped out a number of initiatives to expand people to people and cultural interactions build stronger ties between local governments, and step up the joint efforts in the international regional arena. This visit, which takes place at the beginning of the second decade in the 21st century, has charted the course for our relationship. It also gives the two sides the opportunity to outline the priorities and how to ensure the relationship stay on a stable and sound path. Looking ahead, we have every reason to be optimistic about the prospects of China-U.S. relations. It is important that the two sides take advantage of the fresh start offered by President Hu's visit, maintain the momentum in high-level engagement, deepen mutual strategic trust, expand cooperation, and work more closely in the international regional arena. At the same time, we need to be sensitive to and respect each other's core interests, handle differences and sensitive issues properly, and take forward this cooperative partnership based on mutual respect, mutual benefit. To be specific, I think the two sides need to focus on the following areas. First, we should take a long-term view and foster and increase strategic trust. How to deepen the strategic trust is a big task that we face for now and a period to come. The Chinese government places great value on a cooperative partnership between China and the United States. This commitment is not an expediency, but rather aimed at advancing the common interests of our two countries and maintaining world peace and prosperity. We welcome the U.S. as an Asian Pacific country to contribute peace, stability, and prosperity in the region. President Obama also stated that America welcomes a strong, successful, and prosperous China that plays a bigger role in the whole world, and China-U.S. relationship has the ability to shape the 21st century. More and more people have come to realize that, there is, that this relationship 
between our two countries must, be by, must by no means be a zero-sum game. It should be a relationship that highlights common interests, transcends differences, and driven by deepening mutual strategic trust and partnership. China is firmly committed to peaceful development, which is our strategic choice, and will continue to remain so. We need better appreciate each other's strategic goals and development models so that China-U.S. relationship will lead to mutual respect, mutual benefit, and common development. Secondly, we should reach out more to each other, especially at the top levels. The year 2011 will be an important year for high-level engagement for China-U.S. relations. In addition to President Hu's successful state visit earlier this year, the joint statement also identifies a series of high-level visits and institutionalized dialogues. Our two presidents will meet on a number of occasions, including during the APEC Economic Leaders Meeting in Hawaii in November. We've also agreed that two vice presidents will exchange visits. In the next few weeks, the second meeting of the high-level consultation, people-to-people -people exchanges, and the third strategic and economic dialogue will be held respectively in Washington, D.C. These face-to-face -face exchanges will surely play an important role in steering and strengthening this relationship. Thirdly, we should work together to address global challenges and international regional hotspots. China and America represent the largest economies in the world and, pose it, and possesses global car outreach. More than ever, the world needs us to work together to respond to common challenges. We need to make full use of the bilateral channels and multilateral institutions, work more closely on global economic recovery, climate change, energy security, and other global issues, and touch bases in a timely manner on issues like the Korean Peninsula, Iran, South Asia, and UN reforms. We need to make the international system a fair, just, inclusive, and orderly one. In Asia Pacific, we need to make it safer, stable, and prosperous region, facilitate open and inclusive cooperation so that it will be a region that best manifests China-U.S. partnership and mutual respect. Fourthly, we should continue to strengthen mutually beneficial economic relations and bring greater benefits to our two peoples. Not long ago, the National People's Congress, which is China's parliament, held its annual session. And the most important outcome of the meeting is the adoption of the 12 five-year plan for national economic and social development. It sets forth the development strategy for China in the next five years. The core of the plan is to overhaul our economic structure, expand domestic demand, and improve people's livelihood so that the fruit of the development of China will be spread to all Chinese people. To that end, we will accelerate economic restructuring, shift from the largely export and invest investment-driven pattern, growth pattern to a more balanced one relying on consumption, investment, and export. We will give more emphasis to strategic and emerging industries and modern services. We know that old extensive growth that overexplores resources and the environment will not work, and we replace it with a low carbon and green economy. In the coming years, we will channel more financial resources into environmental protection, new energy and technological innovation, and improve our health care, education, and other social security systems. In addition, it is estimated that this year, China's domestic market will exceed two trillion U.S. dollars, far more than China's total exports. American businesses will continue to benefit from China's expanding domestic consumer market. In the meantime, we have noted that the United States is also going through economic restructuring. The Obama administration has announced a series of plans, including the National Export Initiative, green energy, infrastructure, etc. All these mean new areas and opportunities for China-U.S. cooperation. China will continue to open up. We do not seek long-term trade surplus with the United States and is willing to import more from America. We will contribute to improve our investment environment and provide transparent and level playing uh, and level playing field for American investors. We will continue to enforce the national strategy on intellectual property and IPR legislations. We will proceed with the RMB exchange rate regime reform and gradually increase the flexibility of our RMB of the Yuan and it maintains basic stability at a reasonable and balanced level. At the same time, we hope that the U.S. could make progress on easing restrictions on its exports to China and recognizing China's full market economy status, make it easier for more Chinese companies to invest in the, in the states and provide them with a fair and sound environment for business operations. This will also help with the growth and employment in America. We should manage the issues that emerge as our trade relations expand in a sensible way 
with consultation and mutual accommodation and prevent, prevent these issues from being politicized. Fifthly, we should treat each other as equals and with respect and handle sensitive issues in a proper manner. The history of China and U.S. relations have told us that the relations will grow smooth and stable when the core interests are well taken care of. Otherwise, the relationship would see bumps, even tensions. In this respect, I think issues related to Taiwan and Tibet touch upon China's sovereignty, territory, integrity, and national sentiment of the 1.3 billion Chinese people. We hope that the U.S. side could honor its commitments, follow the norms of international relations, abide by the three joint communiques, and handle these sensitive issues properly so as to maintain the overall interests of our relationship. Since we face different realities in our two countries, it is only natural that we may have different views on human rights. No country has perfect records on human rights. The right thing to do is to respect each other's choice that we think that are the best for our countries and people. We in China have, ever, have never stopped working to protect and promote human rights. We have come a long way in this arena. We will continue to put our people's interests first, ensure that the rights of our citizens are truly protected, and build a harmonious society. We are willing to have a constructive dialogue on human rights with the United States. The conversation should be equal, of course, with mutual respect and with no interference into each other's internal affairs. Last but not least, we should take a forward-looking approach to vigorously promote friendly exchanges between various sectors of our two countries. Amity among peoples is the anchor for state-to-state -state relations. The future of China-U.S. relations in the final analysis hinges on the broad support and active involvement of people from all walks of life in both countries. We should draw up a comprehensive plan on how we will interact more closely in culture, education, technology, and other fields, and encourage more dialogue between our legislatures, local authorities, business communities, academic institutions, media organizations, and other sectors so that more and more people will come on board to support stronger China-U.S. relations and get involved in this course. <clears throat> During President Hu's visit, the two sides announced the China-U.S. Governors Forum, and the first meeting will be held in Utah in July this year. This is a creative initiative to strengthen local and people-to-people -people exchanges and will go a long way in fostering friendship between the Chinese and American people. Another area that we could work on is to let the sister city and sister states' relationship play a bigger role to energize cultural exchanges, encourage more Chinese to come here and more Americans to visit China. Ladies and gentlemen, although Florida and China are not geographically close, we have developed very close ties over the years. For many Chinese, Florida makes an ideal place for holidays. And Orlando, Miami, Key West, and Disney World draw large numbers of Chinese tourists every year. In 2008, the Florida Commission on Tourism opened its representative office in Shanghai. In October 2009, the third China-U.S. Tourism Director Summit was held in Orlando. The construction of the Shanghai Disney World will kick off in the next couple of months. In the economic area between 2000 and 2010, Florida's exports to China have, have grown by 96%. In 2009, affected by the global financial and economic crisis, Florida's exports to other trade partners dropped by 14 percent, but its exports to China still achieved 17 percent growth. This is quite an achievement, but still not enough. Given the total figure of Florida's exports, there are huge potentials that remain untapped in the future. Florida also has an edge in information technology, bioscience, etc., while China has a large market and aspiration to go global. So we have much to offer each other. We hope that Florida will capitalize on these advantages to expand its export business relations with China. We will also encourage Chinese investors to come here and explore opportunities. I'm sure it will be a win-win process for both sides. I know I've been talking too much. I'm going to stop here. But before I conclude, I want to thank all of you for your patience and, all, and attention to share my view on China-U.S. relationship. I wish to... Um, uh, I wish the USCF greater success as you step forward to reach higher aims and deeper friendship between Chinese and American people. Thank you very much, and I'm ready to take your questions. How would a stronger economic and diplomatic alliance between the United States and China, one of the two largest countries in the world, affect their relations with the rest of the world? Well, I think, generally speaking, uh, this relationship 
uh, weighs a lot on not just uh, the well-being of the two peoples and two countries, but also the world peace, stability, and prosperity. Uh, in our point of view, China is the largest developing country in the world, and the United States is the largest developed country in the world. Our two economies have now become the two largest economies in the world. So economically speaking, uh, the economic performance of both two countries have an important bearing on the world economic situation. You can look at how the two countries cooperated and achieved uh, to help stabilize the world economy after the international financial crisis, and how closely we work together uh, in multilateral international mechanism like G20 to help reorder the international financial uh, structure. And I think all of those efforts uh, have been made through very close coordination between China and the United States and many other partners, which is instrumental to the world prosperity. Uh, China and the United States also are very complementary to each other, uh, economically speaking. As I have mentioned during the, uh, the, uh, the new uh, five-year plan uh, for the next five years that have drawn up by the Chinese government, um, we will be focused on re economic restructuring, focused on uh, uh, channeling more resources to stimulate domestic consumption and try to transform the uh, growth pattern of China from one driven mainly by investment and exports to one uh, driven by a more balanced mix of consumption, uh, investment and export. So we believe that is also a, 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 a process that will lead to more opportunities of cooperation with the United States, as obviously the United States is also focused on economic restructuring. For instance, you want to have more in exports from the United States to other countries like China, where China is a huge market that can absorb more, big junk of the uh, export items from the United States. Uh, so, uh, for instance, last year our to to total trade volume reached a record high of uh, 385.3 billion US dollars, and it is estimated with the potential market in China uh, in the, by the year of 2020, this total number of two-way trade volume could reach, if the current tendency continues, a record, another record high of 500 billion US dollars between our two countries. So I do see a great potential of our two countries our uh, economic trade cooperation. As diplomatical, as diplomatical, I think our two countries have, as I've said, kept very close contacts with each other, either bilaterally, multilaterally, globally. There are too many issues in the world that needs our attention. And I think China and the United States set up a very successful uh, mechanism to strengthen our communication, address issues, uh, whether it's uh, international financial crisis, climate change, those global issues, or regional hotspots. I think uh, this very close communication between us, we also give greater benefits to our two countries, show our responsibility to maintain peace and stability of not only Asia Pacific, but also the world as a whole. So uh, I do believe that we have uh, a, a broader a broad, much bro uh, increasing in broadening areas that we can cooperate with each other uh, for the benefits of our two countries and the world at large. So that's one of the reasons, I have, as I said in my uh, speech, I'm optimistic about overall prospects of our relationship in the next years to come. How big Thank is you. the middle class in China now? We've had so many discussions. When I was over there, the streets were packed. I think the car of choice was a Buick. It just looked bustling and et cetera, and you wonder whether there's 100 million or three or 400 million in the Chinese middle class now. I think uh, as, a, as a kind of novel model of development for such a country like China, I think the middle class, mid, the middle income people in China is fascinatingly increasing over the past few years, uh, and that definitely uh, uh, contributes yeah. a lot to the stabilization of the society to the more uh, vigor of the, of the, of the uh, innovation and the uh, development. And I think uh, it's going away uh, uh, towards more parity of the incomes for all people. That's 
One of the areas my government is working very hard to, uh, to achieve social equity in terms of income, in terms of social well-being among all people, to narrow down the differences between rich and poor. Yeah. I can't help but wonder how much of our imports and exports are agriculturally based. And in regards to that, how does China um, propose to bridge the gap between cultural differences and rules and regulations regarding agriculture? Well, I don't have a figure to show how much China imports and exports to United States, how much China imports from the United States and how much United States export China in agriculture. But I do believe that we have uh, uh, an increasingly balanced going trade uh, relations between our two countries. I think, for instance, last, last year amount uh, uh, in, uh, we, uh, the total trade volume reached 385.3 billion U.S. dollars, and about one-third of that volume are U.S. exports going to China. Although it's only one-third of them, but it's uh, 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 a very, another year of high, uh, of strong momentum of the increase of U.S. exports to China. Uh, as w we, we should bear in mind that over the last 10 years, China has become the largest, ex the fastest growing export market for the United States. So I, I suppose that portion of the U.S. export to China will be further promoted as we develop our trade uh, relations in the, in the years to come. Uh, in terms of agriculture, I think we have a lot of commonalities uh, and also uh, many areas to complement each other. For instance, we need soybeans. We import a lot of soybeans, beef, from the United States. Uh, I think uh, China is a very large country uh, with a large population relying on, uh, largely on its own agricultural products, but we also need uh, agricultural imports from other countries, especially from the United States. We have better, we have very good quality soybeans and beef from the United States. Uh, we hope we will continue to import more from, from this country. I think uh, business activities, uh, the exchanges um, in, in, in those areas, of course, can help to the two sides to uh, cross over each other, uh, uh, overcoming the cultural uh, uh, divergencies. Uh, I, I'm sure that the, this has been, become one of the um, uh, very heated topics discussed during the symposium this morning. And I, 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 I hope that you, can, you have already got some uh, uh, satisfactory answer from my colleagues of the embassy. But I think uh, uh, China and the United States do have a long way to go to get to know about each other more, uh, as we do have a uh, very uh, wide uh, a gap of uh, cultural diver uh, difference. Um, but I think uh, uh, one of the ways is to uh, 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 promote education, to have more people like you, young people, to travel to each other, learn from each other. And one of the uh, very exciting phenomena here in the United States is that we have more and more American students interested in studying Chinese uh, with the establishment of uh, more than 300 Confucius Institutes in this country and many, many more Confucius courses. So I hope uh, there will be more American students, including the uh, UCF, to go to study in China. And I think President Obama has already made, announced a very good plan for all of you to go to China in the next four years. So uh, I hope that you all will become uh, uh, in good, the best interlocutor and messenger in help building up a bridge of mutual understanding between the people of our two countries. Uh, my question is, are there technical guiding principles for the Sino-American relationship on which both sides can agree? Um, <laughs> yeah. technical, <laughs> That's your question. Technical, te technical <laughs> principles. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, all of the principles we have established uh, in uh, uh, in developing our relationships have been well reflected in the three joint communiques and the two joint statements we've issued. Um, I think right now, as I've said, the uh, cooperative partnership is uh, many characterized by uh, the spirit of mutual respect and mutual benefit uh, uh, from each side. Um, I, I do believe uh, we have we have those principles that have uh, testified to the uh, to the uh, 
to the uh, transformation of times, and there are very important ones lying the uh, bedrock in our relationship that we should not uh, uh, forget. And uh, but as we move forward, I think we have more uh, opportunity and the necessity to explore into. Uh, new effective ways as to strengthen our cooperation, develop this relationship. And uh, that is uh, why we say, uh, um, while we uh, focus on uh, the uh, details of our cooperation, we need uh, a big picture in our mind, but at the same time, we need a big picture in our mind. We all also have to focus on the details and explore more opportunities of cooperation. Um, obviously, the main differences between China and America is our, or not the difference, but the main problem is our language barrier. And a lot of public schools don't offer Chinese as a curriculum, like as a part of their curriculum. How, if we have more dependency on China, will the leaders of China bring, promote this curriculum for our high schools? That's a good question. I think, uh, first of all, it's. Uh, it's a uh, it's a many endeavor of the uh, of the U.S. Uh, government and people and authorities at various levels. But I think uh, we China-U.S. cooperation can also help to improve the situation. As I've mentioned, we have set up more than 300 Confucius Institutes in this country, uh, which offer uh, Chinese language training courses. Um, I and I know m many of the universities high schools here that have uh, Chinese teaching courses uh, have already included into their curriculum. Um, I don't know how, of course, there are many more universities and high schools that want to have the Chinese teaching to be included in the curriculum. So uh, I think we have, we can discuss that through our future corporate uh, discussion. Uh, I think the uh, Chinese Ministry of Education has very close contact with the, May sec uh, with the Department of Education of the United States. And as I've mentioned, we have set up the people-to-people -people exchange uh, high-level consultation mechanism, which is going to convene uh, sometime later this month. And uh, um, I think education is one of the main four themes to be discussed uh, at the forum. Uh, I think one of the uh, interesting topic, but to, but one of the important topics, interesting both sides, is how to further build Chinese language learning courses here in the United States and how we can have more United States students be sent to China. Uh, I, I, I don't really have any specific data or any information for you uh, in that regard, but I think the general tendency is that there will be more U.S. More and more U.S. universities and high schools that will have Chinese courses taught there that will be included in their curriculum so that it will be uh, uh, really an uh, uh, important uh, a stimulus to uh, include more American young people to nurture their interest in studying Chinese. Um, that will be very important for serving as a bridge to enhance mutual understanding between our two countries and peoples. In the United States these days, there seems to be somewhat of an ongoing campaign to replace the number of consumer products that are made abroad, particularly in China, with consumer products made domestically. Does China perceive this to be a dilemma, especially when the leaders of both states are promising increased trade? Well, I think uh, we have had, as I have said, we have had very strong and robust economic ties between our two countries. Um, we, uh, we believe that this exchange of trade between our two countries fundamentally contributes to the well-being of two peoples. Uh, but of course, any trade is a two-way trade. Um, we, over the years, we know that we have uh, kept a strong momentum of increasing exports to the United States. But we also believe that tendency has brought about greater benefits, not only to the Chinese people, but also to most of the consumers in this country. Um, but at the same time, we, we do not shy away from our vision of a more, seeking a more balanced trade uh, between our two countries, which is having more U.S. exports to China. Uh, and we have been working very hard at that. Um, 
I think one of the big picture we should bear in mind is that we look at the sum of the disputes in terms of relation, economic relations between our two countries is that we should not uh, uh, politicize some of the uh, trade issues. Uh, and uh, from time to time uh, in this country, sometimes uh, the economic and trade issues between our two countries have become too much politicized. Uh, fortunately, I think, and most effectively, we have set up very effective mechanism, the strategic and economic dialogue, the JCCT Joint Committee of Bilateral Trade, and many other mechanisms to discuss and uh, discuss the settlement of the issues and explore into ways of uh, better cooperation. I think the boycott of Chinese goods and products uh, exist maybe in some places here in this country, but I just hope uh, the people there have more, uh, 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 you know, bigger picture in their mind as I think in more, more than uh, in most of the other places in the United States, people welcome Chinese investment, welcome Chinese uh, products, welcome Chinese very cheap and best quality commodities to be to be sold here and used here. So I, I, I think uh, one of the factors why I put that question to you is because maybe sometimes we have some food, some security problem there with Chinese commodities. And uh, is that one of the reasons that they are boycotted by the American consumers? If that is true, I think, uh, first of all, it's our duty to, of course, to make a check on, our, on the quality of our products and make our best efforts to improve the quality so that we we'll provide American consumers the best quality products uh, that, that, uh, that we should do. Uh, secondly, I think we can strengthen our cooperation through the quality inspection, joint quality inspection, uh, by setting up some mechanism. We have already had effective con discussion between our two countries. Uh, I think uh, those efforts will also contribute to the improvement of the uh, commodities quality of China in the market of the United States. Uh, I think uh, what you mentioned, the phenomena, is a really limited one. I think if you look at the overall picture of our relationship in terms of economic trade relations, it's really uh, exciting, robust growth that I think uh, no, neither side can uh, get separate from each other um, and will we'll further get closer uh, in our trade ties in the years to come for the greater benefits of our two countries. Thank you. Thank you. I had a question towards our American products in uh, China and how you're protecting against piracy, and since there are a lot of problems with piracy and our, yeah. Intellectual property, yeah. that issue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's also one of the uh, areas that we have worked extremely hard to fight against, I think, in China. Uh, I think, the, first of all, the Chinese government have put uh, a lot of emphasis on uh, protection of intellectual property rights and uh, efforts on uh, anti-piracy. Uh, we have set up uh, uh, at the national level uh, state uh, council office uh, specifically charged in organizing anti-piracy efforts and intellectual property efforts uh, across the country. We have, secondly, uh, we have strengthened the uh, uh, establishment uh, the, of laws and regulations to crack down anti -pir uh, on piracy, uh, pir pirate activities. Uh, for instance, we have included, uh, by revising laws and regulations, the, the activity of piracy into criminal behavior. And I think that is a uh, very uh, important uh, uh, deterrent against uh, the uh, uh, criminal uh, uh, behave violations of, of IPR. Uh, we also welcome and appreciate uh, a coordination and cooperation with many other countries, including the United States, as to how to strengthen the international effort to fight against piracy and have a better prote protection of IPR. Uh, I think China, as I've said, is still a developing country. We, are, we have achieved a lot of success in our economy, but still we have very <coughs> imbalanced development back home in China with uh, a very big gap between the rich and poor, very imbalanced development from the coastal area 
and the hinterland, and I think also uh, disparity of income between the rich and poor. So owing to the current level of China's e economic development, uh, this kind of uh, uh, intellectual violation, in property IPR violations and piracy activities uh, are really unavoidable. And uh, it is uh, a kind of uh, phenomenon that will be there along with the whole process of China's development. But I think that doesn't shy away our responsibility on strengthening our hand uh, and crack down on piracy. And we do more, and we wish to we, have, uh, we have more cooperation from the United States uh, in our joint efforts to address this, uh, uh, this problem. But I think we, the Chinese government is definitely resolved uh, to, uh, to uh, intensify our efforts to uh, protect uh, IPR uh, because it is uh, really uh, the foundation of any innovation and also uh, the economic development. So uh, we do value the conception of per, uh, protecting uh, IPR protection, and we will continue to push ahead with our efforts in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And would uh, also all the wonderful speakers who are here please stand so we can thank you. Come on. You can turn around and look at everybody, it's all right. <laughs>